Right, uh, good morning everybody. Uh, I'm just introducing myself. I'm Council Spencer Flower, Leader of Council, and I'll be chairing this uh, meeting today. Um, but colleagues, both Cabinet and uh, other members, if you want to uh, ask a question or make a comment, please use RTS on the chat box so I can see who wants to speak. And as you know, I have a, a, a habit of allowing um, colleagues from across the chamber, if they want to speak um, after a report's been uh, delivered, prior to a debate, please indicate and I'll give you the opportunity to do so. So we got a number of, um, uh, I'm going to take, uh, introduce the cabinet by simply saying all the cabinet are present today and um, as and when cabinet members speak to an item and ask them to introduce themselves the first time and say what their cabinet role is. And it's the same with officers. We've got a, a lot of officers here today for a whole host of very good reasons. So once again, I'm not going to go through all the names, but as and when they do have to speak for the first time, can they just say who they are and what their role in, in the council is? So Kate, apologies for absence. Good morning, Chairman. Clerk to the committee. Um, I have apologies from the Chief Executive and Theresa Levy, um, Executive Director. Thank you very much. Minutes of the meeting held on the 30th of June. Are, are we all content with the minutes as, as presented? Or can Agreed. I sign them? Agreed. They're content. Thank you very much. I'll do that when the opportunity arises. Not yet, I, I suspect. Um, declarations of interest. Any mem member got any declarations of interest they wish to uh, declare? No. Right, Particip public participation. We've got um, a number of questions today and uh, Jonathan Mayer and an another officer, either David McIntosh or John Selgrim will share the, the job of going through the, uh, the questions and then individual uh, cabinet members will um, uh, come forward with an answer. So the first question is from Sarah James, Chief Executive of the Arts Development Company. Um, and I think, who's, who's gonna start? Are you starting, Jonathan? Yes, I am Chairman. Uh, good Thank morning. You. Jonathan Mayer, Corporate Director, Legal and Democratic. Uh, this is the question from Sarah James. Uh, why is arts and culture not mentioned nor name checked in the Council's economic growth strategy as a key industry contributing to Dorset and one which needs supporting through the recovery plans? Thank you, Jonathan. Gary Suttle. Uh, thank you, it's Gary Suttle, Economic uh, Growth and Skills Portfolio Holder. Um, I welcome the question from Sarah James and acknowledge that arts and culture do have a role to play in the future prosperity of Dorset. And this will be acknowledged in the final strategy. The significance of arts and culture has been discussed during the development of a strategy and they have a particular role to play in addressing crucial issues such as seasonality, bringing vibrancy to our towns and making Dorset an attractive inward investment proposition. Arts and culture have been severely impacted by COVID-19 and we must seek to recover and increase resilience to future economic shocks. These issues will be detailed further, further in the action plan to accompany the strategy and we look forward to working with the Arts Development Company and other appropriate partners. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gary. Uh, there's a question now from uh, Julianne uh, Booker on behalf of Extinction Rebellion. Who's, who's going to ask? Chairman, it's John Sergren, Executive Thank Director you, for Place, and I'm going to read the question from Julianne Booker. When will Dorset Council's climate and ecological strategy include a fully costed and timetabled action plan? Thank you, John. Ray Bryan. Yes, I'm Councillor Ray Bryan, Cabinet Member for Highways, Travel and Environment. Um, as included in the next exception of the climate strategy, work is now taking place on a costed, detailed action plan, which will map out Dorset Council's journey to being carbon neutral by 2040 against the carbon budgeting set out in the strategy document on page 22. Our action plan will set out our objectives, specific detailed actions, who in Dorset Council will, will be responsible. Timescales and performance measures. We will also include details of other key partners required to help deliver these actions. The scale of the potential carbon savings and associated co-benefits 
health, economy, ecology and resilience. The action plan will be completed and presented by to Dorset Council Cabinet in October 2020. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. Now I've got a question from Len Herbert. I presume that's you, Jonathan, is it? Um, morning, Leader. It's David Mackins. Oh, hello, David. Director. Hello. It's the Corporate Director for HR and OD, and I'll um, read the question from Mr Herbert. And that is, so I asked Dorset Council what the next step is to communicate the climate and ecological emergency in a letter to all Dorset residents, businesses and institutions telling the truth in a concise format about the crisis facing us and the actions we must take to avoid its worst implications. Thank you, David. Ray Bryan. Yes, um, the release of the draft strategy and public consultation will be comprehensively communicated by Dorset Council through a wide variety of channels, including social media, website and printed media. The climate change strategy forms the public facing document and is a summary of all the techni full technical analysis found in the, uh, the accompanying technical papers, which can be accessed using the links in the strategy. There are numerous images, diagrams and video links, along with a glossary and index to make sure the reading the document is as easy as possible but which unenviably adds to the length of the overall document. The consultative questions will be clearly linked to the relevant sections of the strategy to make answering the questions as easy as possible. Each section of the public consultation document will contain an executive summary of the subject area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. We've now got a question from Michael Tunbridge. Thank you, Over Chef. to Jonathan. Chairman, this is a question from Mr. Michael Tunbridge, who's concerned about um, investment by the Dorset Pension Fund uh, in fossil fuels. Uh, and his question is, on 16th July 2020, Shropshire Council took the lead and called on the Shropshire County Pension Fund to divest from fossil fuels within three years. And they resolved to include fossil fuel investments in their carbon footprint accounting. Will Dorset Council take similar steps? Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, Jonathan. Peter Wolf. Thank you, Chair. Peter Wolf, Deputy Leader and Vice Chair. Uh, I read this question out in my capacity as the Vice Chair of the Pensions Committee. The Chair of the Pension Committee is Minister Councillor Andy Canning, who has approved this response as I do. The response is as follows. <laughs> As you recognise in your question, the governance arrangements for the Dorset County Pension Fund are complex. While Dorset Council is the fund administrator, the Pension Fund Committee is made up of members from BCP, that's Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole, and a staff representative, as well as Dorset councillors. We are conscious that both Dorset Council and BCP have declared a climate emergency, and I can assure you that the Pension Fund Committee will take this fully into account when it makes its investment decisions. The Pension Fund reviews its investment strategy every three years based on an independent actuarial analysis of our level of funding and any action that is required to meet any shortfall. This is followed by an independent evaluation of investment prospects leading to recommendations concerning the fund's investment strategy. We will receive these recommendations in the next few weeks and they will be discussed and agreed at our meeting on September the 10th. We have specifically requested that the independent <coughs> excuse me, evaluation includes an assessment of the merits of a decarbonisation strategy versus a fossil fuel free strategy. However, to further complicate matters, we are members of the Brunel Investment Partnership and are moving speedily to the transfer of all of our investments into their pooled funds. The Brunel Partnership is committed to leading the way on a sustainable investment and it is achieving this by a commitment that its mainstream funds are in line with the targets set in the Paris Climate Accord and, as a minimum, we will reduce their carbon footprint by 7% a year. Launch, uh, the second point, launching a series of sustainable funds with low carbon footprints. 
The first of these, the Global Passive Low Carbon Fund, has a carbon footprint of around 50% compared to the MSCI World Index. Brunel will be launching three sustainable further funds in September, details of which will be presented to the committee uh, at the meeting that I referred to some moments ago. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Peter. We've got a question now from Bridget Jocelyn. Chairman John Sargren, Executive Director for PLACE. I'm going to uh, speak to this question. Um, so the question asked by Bridget Jocelyn relates to item 15 on the agenda for this meeting, the draft Dorset Council Climate and Ecological Emergency Strategy. And Bridget Jocelyn's question is, uh, is this, are the targets in that document ambitious enough? I'll ask Ray Bryan to respond, please. Yes. Dorset Council made it clear at the point at which it declared a climate and ecological emergency that its strategy to tackle this would be based upon informed and fully investigated actions against a realistic timetable that was achievable, set out against the financial pressures that are facing not just Dorset Council, but all local authorities. The carbon budgeting section of the strategy shows the progress towards carbon neutrality will bring about significant reductions in carbon emissions well in advance of the 2040 target. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ray. And we've got one of two questions from Dave Warren now. So question one from Dave Warren. Thank you, Chairman. It's David McIntosh. Um, Mr Warren's first question has a preamble which is on the screen and available in public. And his question is, please could the Climate and Environmental Advisory Panel publish their findings and recommendations concerning the environmental and ecological effects of energy from waste incineration. Because if this is truly a forward thinking document, it needs to advise on both current and potential future events that will impact on the county's ability to achieve its climate targets. Thank you, David. Ray Bryan. Yes, as part of any future waste treatment solution, a range of technologies and different solutions would be explored taking into the account environmental and ecological impact assessments, not just EFW. The results of this research and any future, future waste treatment solution would be publicly available. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. We've we got a second question from Dave Warren now. No, I've got two questions from Dave Warren on here. No, Chairman, um, Jonathan Mayor, Corporate Director, Legal and Democratic. Uh, the second question from Mr Warren again has a preamble which is on the screen. Right. His second question concerns energy from waste and he asks the Council to revisit their position on the future use of energy from waste as a method to manage Dorset's residual waste. Th thank you, Jonathan. Ray, Ray Bryan. Yes, the Joint Municipal Waste Strategy for Dorset was adopted in 2008 and revised in 2017. This was prior to the Green List being developed and prior to the Council declaring a climate change emergency. The Joint Municipal Waste Strategy for Dorset sets out the strategic direction for Dorset's waste up until 2033. However, it has already been updated and is due to be updated every five years, or if there's any significant change. A significant change in the waste industry is the government's waste and resources strategy for England 2019. Therefore, any updated strategy during 2022 will take into account all of these local, national and international changes. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Again, I've got two questions from David Ridgewell and the first one, please. Chairman. John Sogren, Executive Director for PLACE. I'm going to read the first question from David Regwell. Uh, as uh, members will see, there's some preamble to this in relation to specific bus routes. Uh, Mr Regwell's first question is, how Dorset Council is going to ask the Department for Transport to fund the public transport strategy? I'll ask Ray Bryan to respond, please. Uh, excuse me one second. I seem to have uh, lost my response. Sorry about this, Chairman. Chairman, can we come back to this a little bit Is there bit a response later? on the screen? Is there a response on the screen or not? No, Chairman. No, okay. Right, Chairman, I now have it. Sorry you about that. It. Okay, yep. it's all right, Ray. 
Yeah, public transport is a component of the response to the climate and ecological emergency and will be reviewed as part of the local transport plan and included in the climate and ecological action plan. Sorry about that delay. That's OK. Now we've got a second question from David uh, Redwell. Um, thank you, Chairman. It's David McIntosh, Corporate Director for HRNOD. Um, Mr. Redwell's second question relates to investment in rail infrastructure and makes reference in the preamble, which is on the screen, to access to um, Bristol, um, to disabled access um, at stations and the use of freight, amongst other things. And his question is, what bid is the Council making with the Western Gateway Transport Board to fund vital railway improvements and services in the plan? Thank, thank you, David. Ray Bryan. Yes, thank you for the question. As as yet, there are no bidding opportunities via the Western Gateway Subnational Transport Body, better known as the SDB, for rail improvements. What we are doing is pre preparing a rail strategy with our partners in the SDB, which will put us in the right position to make the best case for investment in Dorset and set it within the regional context. Poor connectivity within Dorset is bad news for our neighbours as well as for us. We can then use this strategy as a basis for working with rail, the rail industry and the Department for Transport to bring much needed investment in Dorset's railways. In addition to the Western Gateway strategy, we are also working with Network Rail on their continuous modular, modular strategic plan for Dorset which is addressing many of the issues you raise, such as the hourly service on the heart of Wessex line. It aims to ascertain what is achievable and what needs to be done to make aspirations deliverable. It is anticipated this work will be completed by the end of the year. To respond on a couple of specifics in your lead in, I understand from Network Rail that they intend to start constructing disabled access to the northbound platform at Dorchester West later this year also using some access for all funding. Network Rail and Southern Southwestern Railway will be providing step free access to each platform, though not between at Dorchester South Station. As regards Wareham Station, Dorset Council continued to work closely with train operating companies to provide a regular rail service between Swanage and Wareham. Dorset Coast Forum in partnership with Dorset Council has a successful bid to Southwestern Railway Customer and Communities Improvement Form Fund, which has been used as part of a package of improvements known as the Weymouth Station Gateway. Project more information can be found at the uh, www.dorsetcoasthaveyoursay.co.uk. A press release about the consultation will be going out in the next couple of weeks. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Ray. And the last question this morning, a uh, public question from Luke Wakeling. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, oh, hang on, we have not a question yet. Sorry. Chairman Jonathan there, Corporate Director, <laughs> Legal and Democratic. Question for Mr. Wakeling. Again, uh, the full preamble is on the screen. Uh, his question concerns the availability of broadband in Dorset. Uh, what are you doing and when will we see the results to bring the next generation of internet access, i.e. greater than 100 megabytes per second, to the residents of Dorset, what do you say to the young people of Dorset who are looking for jobs and opportunities in technology and think they need to leave our beautiful county to succeed? Thank you very much, Jonathan. This is a topic that Peter is particularly interested in. So, Peter Wolf. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, thank you to Councillor Luke Wakeling who put this question in for the previous cabinet but, but missed the deadline. So, uh, <clears throat> you are having your question answered now. Um, Peter Wolf, Portfolio Holder for Corporate Development and Change. Uh, Dorsey Council recognises that the universal provision of superbus broadband is critical to the future economic and social prosperity of the County of Dorset. The Superfast Dorset programme provides gap funding state aid to build open access superfast broadband network in locations where the commercial market will not provide a solution. It has been working with BT Open Reach over the past five years and has delivered access to Superfast broadband to over 84,000 premises in the county and a host of related activity to ensure strategic benefits are realised. Access to Superfast broadband in Dorset has grown from a pre-contract level of 77% to 96% Superfast availability across the county. The starting 
the starting level of coverage represented the handoff point of commercial deployment in Dorset, beyond which gap funding with council, central government and Dorset LEP funding was necessary to fast track further network expansion. As Councillor Wakeling alludes to, the focus is, on, is moving on to building faster gigabit networks. The starting point for this is low in Dorset, in common with many predominantly rural counties. The national strategy was set out in July 2018 in Future Telecoms Infrastructure Review, and this concluded that the most effective way to deliver nationwide full fibre connectivity at pace is to promote competition and commercial investment where possible and intervene where necessary. This is a long term agenda nationally and in Dorset. <clears throat> Many actions are particular to central government and relate to changes to the regulatory Ofcom and taxation regimes to encourage greater investment. Specifically in Dorset, we are working with suppliers, big and small, to understand their commercial plans and see how we can support deployment through operating best practice in relation to street works. <coughs> Excuse me. Facilitate network design and access to land and to ensure that new build is provisioned with fibre. Our remaining contract with Openreach is now building exclusively full fibre in rural areas. Business and communities are able to access the rural gigabit voucher scheme, again subsidising con connectivity at gigabit speeds. We are working with central government to understand the opportunity and likely impact of the gigabyte, gigabit outside in programme as it is called. It is too soon to know what the impact in Dorset of this five billion national programme will be. But it is clear that this intervention programme will be needed in large parts of Dorset where the market will not provide solutions alone. The first outcomes from this intervention are expected from 2022 onwards. However, it is worth noting that this programme is being designed for those areas where commercial investment is not likely to occur. We are currently in discussions with Chris Loder MP who is working on our behalf and on behalf of all of the Dorset MPs <coughs> to lobby for improved connectivity within government. Dorset Council recognises the importance of faster networks and on this month's cabinet agenda you will see items A approving our economic strategy which recognises digital infrastructure as a foundation for sustain sustainable and inclusive economic growth and B seeking our own and Dorset LEP investment in full fibre infrastructure. Government's ambition is to complete a national rollout by 2025. This is recognised by industry as a really stretching target. By way of comparison, the future telecoms infrastructure review gave a completion date of 2033. If Councillor Wakening would like more information or to delve deeper in relation to his own town or ward, Dougal Lockhart, the lead officer on broadband and mobile infrastructure, would be delighted to meet him virtually or otherwise to discuss further. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Peter. Good, very comprehensive uh, response, one may say. Right, we've got two statements. Um, I know Cabinet have seen them, so I don't intend to get them read out. Uh, but I know that uh, John Selgren wants to comment on the first one from Paula. Uh, Chairman John Selgren, Executive Director for PLACE. So the statement uh, from Paula Contesci, which you've got before you, uh, is in relation to item 15 on the agenda uh, for this meeting, the draft Dorset Council Climate an ecological emergency strategy, uh, which is being discussed this morning for consideration for public consultation. Um, Paul has made two specific uh, uh, points in relation to the text of the report, Chairman. The first in relation to the finan financial implications contained in the body of the report, and the second is in relation to the climate implications similarly contained in the body of the report. Further, she suggested two specific uh, additions in relation to the background papers. Those relate to issues of energy and secondly, in relation to waste. Thank you very much, John. Right, we've now gone to agenda item five, which is questions uh, from members. We've got four questions, written questions today. And the first one's from John Andrews. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I, uh, my question is, in Sherborne we have an upcoming problem in early years education with the possible loss and probable loss of 16 jobs and display, displacement of 72 nursery places. This will have an impact not only on the children but the ability of their parents to go back to work, the knock-on of which could be enormous for the local economy. Only someone with an extremely large crystal ball would have seen this coming up in the lift and as a member of the EAP on the economy, I know as a group we didn't see it coming. What impact in growth in Dorset 
does the cabinet see is possible with closures estimated at 25 